Please welcome to the stage, Sarah Shea. Thank you, Thor. Um, thank you. It's a big show. Uh, I am still actually kind of surprised that I do comedy at all because I actually consider myself a rather shy person. And um, you can imagine what it's been like to have a name that is essentially a tongue twister. Uh, <laughs> try saying, this is Sarah Shea. Um, it's hard, so I just say, hi, uh, <laughs> I'm Sarah. Um, yeah, but, uh, so I, but I decided, you know, it's important for me to, to do the stand-up because I, I need to be an advocate, you know, for other shy people and speak on their behalf because they can't do it for themselves. <laughs> and um, I think... <laughs> I think that the most important thing, the number one thing that we would like people to know is that we do not understand this obsession you have with trying to get us to come out of our shells. Um, you know, come on, come out of your shell. I really don't understand why everyone doesn't pool their resources and try and get the really loud, obnoxious guy back in his shell. <laughs> Clearly, that is the way, you know, to make the, the event better. Come on, guy, go back in your shell. Come on. There's a conga line in there. Yeah, no, you can keep the lampshade hat on. It's fine. Um, of course, I would be lost because someone would show up late to the party and, you know, they didn't get the memo and they'd see him sitting over in the corner subdued and be like, hey, guy, why are you so shy? Come out of your shell. We'd be like, no, no. We just got him in there. <laughs> Leave him be. Um, everyday things that I think people take for granted are really hard for shy people, um, like crossing the street. Nightmare. <laughs> because uh, everyone in their cars is uh, just glaring at you. And I know there's some guy sitting there thinking, if she hadn't hit that walk button, I'd be home having dinner by now. <laughs> but, um, you know, you finally work up the nerve and you say, you know, I have a right to cross the street. And <laughs> so you go and you get about halfway and then what happens? You know, you get the like, don't walk, don't walk. Um, it's very jarring. I, I don't... Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why it can't encourage you. Like, come on, come on, come closer. You're almost there. You can make it. You did it. You made. She made it. Yay! Um, they figured out how to get a hand on there. Just have it do something nice. Um, or like, you know, getting hit by a car. Um, that's also a problem. Um, <laughs> you know, because when you're shy, it, it overshadows your reaction to just about everything. So normally, um, when someone gets hit by a car, um, they would probably think, uh, ow. Um, <laughs> ow. Uh, that really hurt. <laughs> and, um, for shy people, they just think, oh no, this is embarrassing. <laughs> Everybody is staring at me. I am the center of a bona fide scene that, depending on the circumstances, you very well may have caused. 
What? Oh, an ambulance with the lights and the siren? No, no, that's okay. Um, no, not necessary. You can just send a, a black town car or something. Um, usually it's the police and not the victim saying, move along, there's nothing to see here. Just a woman on the ground. It's not a big deal. Um, I get stressed even trying to go shopping now because everything's just getting way too personal. Um, it used to be the salesperson, you know, they would let you know their name. And now they want your name too. Hi, I'm Melissa. What's your name? Anonymous shopper. <laughs> fine, fine, it's Sarah. Happy? Now we're Melissa and Sarah. Those aren't generic roles. That's not, you know, salesperson and shopper. Melissa and Sarah, that's like two former college roommates that started a catering business together. <laughs> Just, um, fine. At least, um, at least that's not happening. Like when you go out to eat, it's still just the waiter giving you his name. He doesn't have time to get everyone else's name at the table. And I don't want them to get any ideas. So to all the people out there that like to introduce themselves back to the waiter, uh, I would like you to stop. So, <laughs> um, well, hi, Josh. My name is Matt. I'll be your customer today. I think um, sitting at the table uh, with a menu and maybe a hungry look in your eye is enough. <laughs> then um, that is how he can know that you are the customer. <laughs> so I just don't want that to take off. Um, I find too that it's, it's hard to make friends um, when you're shy because I don't think you can ever truly know a person until you go out dancing with them. <laughs> and yet, it's really not a good idea to uh, go out dancing with people you don't know. <laughs> because uh, you learn things and it's too late. Um, here's a, a tip. Uh, if you show up for the night out and all the girls you're with look like solid gold dancers um, and you look more like a summer camp counselor uh, with some form of khakis and maybe a belt um, through the loops uh, through the loops that's, um, that's what they're there for. Uh, you probably don't have enough in common, and I promise you, you will spend the whole night just plotting your escape from the evening of fun. Um, for, you know, you'll look for that, that one girl in the group that's a little in the middle, you know, maybe seems a little bit smarter than the other girls. And um, she's so usually the girl with the car, and um, <laughs> she usually takes off early, and that's when you realize, oh, oh, that's why she drove here. <laughs> so she could drive home. Not only is she smarter than the other girls, she's apparently smarter than me. <laughs> but the party girls are never worried. Like, they always have it covered. I'm sure someone here can give us a ride home. Uh, one of the strangers. Uh, why am I the only one that's been given the gift of fear? <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm not getting in the van. I'm calling a cab. It's on that cab ride home that you think, why didn't I decide to stay home and play Scrabble? Like, what is the worst thing that could have happened? Like, I get all one-point consonants, you know? <laughs> like, a, a double word play when it's not yours. It's unfortunate, but it's not dangerous. Um, there is, I think there is one good thing about, like, the nightclubs, and that is that they usually have a, a velvet rope out front you know, for the line, which I, I think that's great because um, it gives a chance for people of this generation to sort of understand what it may have been like for their grandparents to do their banking. <laughs> but 
That's it. That's all I can think of is like... <laughs> and you can get that driving by. So, stay home. Game night. Um, game night's fun. Uh, a lot of jobs are, I find, they're being taken over t by technology more and more. And um, it's kind of sad because you start thinking, you know, what is going to be left for people to do? And, uh, but sometimes it is so fully warranted and you can't believe a job ever existed. Uh, like I think the elevator operator should not have been shocked when he was let go. <laughs> you really don't need someone to help you do that. And I just imagine the embarrassment of the building owners the day they got there early and were like, I think I'm gonna just try to figure this thing out. And um, they hit the button and it brought them right to their floor. <laughs> We have been paying someone to do this. Carlson, excuse me, Carlson, get in here. I got here early today. And instead of waiting for you like I usually do, I decided to just try it myself. And it turns out that anyone that can recognize numbers and has a finger and can do this can get here by himself. So I'm. I'm sorry. Well, we're going to have to let you go. I'm sorry about that. Poor Carlson. Had to get a new job. I always think it's going to be fun when I start a new job because I think, oh, I need new job clothes. And it's like um, I'm, when I need back to school clothes. But um, they're not fun, like back to school clothes. And I realize, you know, I'm not setting the outfits out on my bed the night before and like planning my first five outfits. I'm like, that's not fun. This isn't going to be fun. It's a job. Um, you try to make it fun. I, um, I learned something about myself at work when I decided that I would bring in donuts for everybody. And I was so excited because I thought, this is going to be so great. And everyone's going to be so happy about these donuts. And everyone's going to want a donut. So I'm just going to email my little department and let them know about the donuts. And so I did. And um, then nobody came and got a donut. And, um, you know, I'd go to leave for like 20 minutes and I'd think, oh, I bet some more will be gone and there wouldn't be. And um, I know, so sad. Um, <laughs> The really the saddest part is I didn't realize how much I was counting on like the visiting and oh you brought donuts and um, so then I said okay I'm gonna have to put these in the kitchen I'm gonna have to put them in a more common area and my initial reaction to that was um, well then no one will know that I brought them and um, <laughs> you know what am I supposed to put a sign up like compliments of Sarah Shea extension 3398 if you want to thank me like that's not appropriate <laughs> So, um, so as soon as I realized that, I, I knew I had to bring them there. But then something wonderful happened where I realized, oh, I could be like the Amelie of the office and be like the anonymous angel. And no one would know that I brought this joy into their lives. And, you know, I could like peek around the corner and watch people like <laughs> their faces light up when they saw the donuts. And, um, Co-workers falling in love because they both reached for the same donut at the same right? right? So it's rewarding. I'll bring them again someday. Uh, if you ever decide to go see a psychologist to de deal with your fears of public speaking, and he tells you that whenever you're around someone that makes you nervous, um, in order for them to seem less intimidating, you should just picture them in like wacky pajamas. Um, you should ask him if you make him nervous. And if he says yes, just leave immediately because that's just weird, you know? <laughs> and and if you go to the next one, and he tells you, oh, whenever you're around someone nervous, just picture them in a clown suit, um, you should ask him if, 
if you make him nervous. Uh, and if he says yes, also leave immediately. Because I think it's really important for a therapist to take you seriously. <laughs> so, uh, I want to just take a moment and apologize to men wearing business suits and riding their bikes. Um, something has changed and it's nothing you did. I don't know when it happened, but um, I used to see you and think, wow, despite his high-powered office job, he is making fitness a priority. And now when I see you, I think he has had his license revoked. <laughs> about and I'm sorry it's not like you were weaving on the road uh, I think that bill collectors should always make one last call to say thank you thank you for finally sending that in I I had my doubts that you ever would and <laughs> I'd like to think in some small way that I maybe played a part in that happening. <laughs> uh, for a long time, you weren't sending it in. And then I started calling you. And then you sent it in. Um, I'm going to miss you. <laughs> I'm going to miss your voice on the answering machine. And... Yes, there's things I take back. Those Saturday morning calls and the hang-ups, I can't change that. But I hope you give me another chance. And judging by your credit history, which I have here in front of me, um, you probably will. So, you know, goodbye for now. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye, Bill Collector. Um, I've spent a, a good men number of years uh, being single, and it's fun, absolutely, has its place. But um, one thing that I've always struggled with is sometimes I have trouble relating to other single women because I think that a lot of them are a little bit confused as to why it is that they're single. Um, because most of them will have the same lament and they'll say, oh, all the good guys are either married or living in Alaska. <laughs> and that's just not true. There's, you know, this whole other group of men out there, uh, which is guys that aren't interested. <laughs> and... <laughs> And they just don't include that. And I think it's hurting them. Uh, my, I have a brother and sister, and they're both married. And I am not. And um, that's good. Good, good for them. Um, <laughs> love is good. But uh, love and commitment. But, um, you know, sometimes it would be hard, you know, just like going home for the holidays because I found that I find that in comparison you start to feel like you're getting treated like a little kid um, like all the married couples um, like when they're handing out the room assignments they get really good ones like um, a, like a bedroom <laughs> And, um, and then you just sort of get what's left. Like, oh, you're going to be sharing a room with little Susie. <laughs> it's the dining room. <laughs> we laid some sleeping bags out on the floor, and she spilled a fort. So <laughs> it's going to be fun. Um, but that wasn't so alarming as when I started to feel like I was being treated like an elderly member of my family. Because um, my father, whenever he would be 
figuring out the plans, you know, he would um, sort of recap and he'd say, okay, so your sister, she'll be with his, her husband's family and, um, you know, Chris, your brother, he'll be, he'll be with his wife and of course, we'll have Sarah. <laughs> And then it seemed like my brother and sister wanted to try to, you know, help with the bird and like, oh, dad, you had her at Thanksgiving. We'll take her for Christmas. <laughs> oh, would you? <laughs> I wanted to take a cruise. That would be, that would be great. Uh, my dad, I think my dad is such a character. Um, you know, a lot of times when people make a mistake and then they'll just say, oh, whoops, sorry, um, I was wrong. And, and then, like, my dad's one of these people that he'll try to get, just get some kind of credit for what he did, what he did do. Um, so, like, he would, he would say to me, um, so are you still dating Mitch? And I would say, oh, well, actually, uh, dad, his name is Mick. And he'd say, oh, what did I say? And I said, well, you, you said Mitch. And then, well, I was close, <laughs> right? It's not like I called him Tom. <laughs> no, no, it's not like that at all. Uh, <laughs> I should not have even corrected you. <laughs> it's only been two years. <laughs> it's not a big deal. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I have a boyfriend, and he's, um, he's great. And uh, for a long time, I also thought that he was extremely chivalrous. Because um, whenever we would go out, he would always, always, always uh, walk over to the passenger side of his car and unlock my door for me. Uh, and then one day, we went on a trip, and we rented a car. And he walked... Um, kind of to the middle, and he just went click, click. <laughs> and then I realized, oh, maybe I don't have a, a chivalrous boyfriend so much as one with a really old car. <laughs> maybe that is what it is. And I can't deny, I mean, that's very convenient. You know, I can't deny the technology. And I know he's going to upgrade one day and get an auto lock. And I don't know, I think I'm gonna need him to ease into it. Like, yes, you can click, click it open, but then I need like a flourish, like for you to present it <laughs> to me and say like, my lady, here you go. <laughs> because it's just hard to come back from that. Um, yeah, but maybe he'll get a, a new car for Christmas, because that seems to be something that they want people to get other people. Um, and whenever I see those ads where the, the people get the new car and they have this surprise look on their face, I don't think so much that it's, um, oh, I got a car for Christmas, as much as like, oh, he's cleared out the bank account. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Um, one year there was um, one of these car dealers, um, they had this ad campaign where um, they had people tying a string around their finger to remember that the sale was going to be happening. And I don't know what was keeping the people in the ad from remembering the sale because they all appeared to be living lives of leisure. Um, so they'd be like playing tennis and you'd see the string and sitting by the pool um, with the string. And um, I thought, what drives someone to just wear a string around their finger? Like was the shame of driving last year's model just too much to bear? <laughs> like what would it take to snap them back into reality? Like they'd see someone else with a string and try to relate. Like, hey, so you're, you're trying to remember to buy your new car too? Oh. No, sometimes I forget to take my insulin. <laughs> um, I guess I have my priorities screwed up. Well, I hope you get a car for Christmas. I hope you do. Um, I, I go to, you know, modest lengths to try to avoid certain trends that come about. Um, you know, like the ones that I just think, 
no, that's, that's not a good idea. Um, I would just be doing that because everyone else is. And um, I'm starting to find that it really doesn't matter whether I avoid them or not because I find that once enough time goes by, people will assume you took part in it simply because you lived during that time. Um, which is hard, you know, when I, when I um, have new people in my life that, that haven't known me forever and they try to bond by saying like, hey, what were we doing with our hair in the 80s? And um, I'll say, oh, well, I was, I was doing a soft bob. Um, <laughs> some bangs just swept to the side. I don't know, but um, <laughs> not only is that like a little bit standoffish, but um, they, I, I don't even think it's believable. Like, why would they believe me? You know, who would want to admit to that anyway? And um, all I can think is that, you know, I would need to take a picture of myself every single day and put it in a, a photo book labeled proof. And <laughs> then years from now, like seven years from now, when I meet my new neighbor and she's trying to become friends, and she'll say, hey, what were we thinking back in the zeros when we were... Um, wearing those sweatpants, and they would say things like sassy across the back. And I'll think, um, well, I don't know, but uh, let's look at my book, because I don't remember. Oh, oh, I was thinking jeans and a sweater. So, I don't know what you were thinking. But you are sassy, and you don't need a pair of pants to tell you that. We can be friends, right? I just complimented you. You're sassy. Yeah, uh, so I have trouble making friends. And, um, <laughs> and I'm starting to think trouble keeping them as well. Um, I live in LA, and, but I'm originally from the East Coast. And so a lot of my friends still live back there. And I have a good number of relationships that exist primarily on the telephone. And that can take its toll. Uh, lately, I get the feeling that even though one of my friends is calling me, she doesn't really want to talk to me because she'll call me at home in the middle of the day when clearly I am at work. <laughs> uh, I, I go to work uh, all day. Um, <laughs> every day, um, Monday through Friday. And that really doesn't change um, ever from week to week. And it's sad because uh, her message will sound so sincere, like, oh, hi, I was just calling to chat. I wish you were home. Well, I, I wish I was home too. You've called at noon on a Tuesday. <laughs> I, I wish that your phone call was waking me up. But once in a while, I, I will be there, and I'll, I'll catch the call. And she'll admit exactly what she's up to. Like, oh, oh, I, I, uh, I didn't think you'd be home. <laughs> I was just, um, I was just going to leave a message. Oh, OK. Well, go ahead. I'll take a message. <laughs> go ahead. I'll take, I'll take that message. No, no, I'm homesick today, so you'll want to try me at my work number. <laughs> I, I know that you have it because you called me there on Saturday. <laughs> I got the message Monday. I know it. Um, oh, this one time I was going to go camping. And then I remembered, I'm afraid of bears. So I canceled the trip. And my friends are like, Sarah, that's, that's so silly. You know, bears are far more afraid of you than you are of them. And I thought, oh, really? What if I am eating a giant cheeseburger? Is the bear still afraid of me? Or is he going to try to take it? And they were like, oh. No, that's, that's because they love food. And I thought, well, I love food. But 
you know, I'm not going to tackle a bear for his ice cream sundae. <laughs> I, no. I am the one that is more afraid because I am committed to my fear. <laughs> Bears are big and they're strong and they won't listen to reason. So, uh, I'm just curious, probably not, because I'm in Columbus, but um, has anyone here recently been to see um, Dr. Glenda Jackson? No? No, okay. That's fine. I have. I have. I went. And uh, apparently, she has done away with the cloth gowns. Uh, you are now getting handed a sheet of paper with some holes cut out for your arms. I, I think she's taking the time to starch and iron it. <laughs> Um, it's very stiff. You can move, but it won't move with you. <laughs> and it is very hard to advocate for yourself when you are dressed like that. <laughs> and I'm afraid the next time I go, it's just going to be like a thing of cardboard and with some tabs, you know, like a paper doll to fold over my shoulder. <laughs> and when I leave, they'll just, you know, like fold the, the bill onto my wrist. Um, and I just, you know, I want to know. We had such a good thing going with the cloth. And, and I just, I want to know who ruined that for us. Like, who decided that they were going to take off with their cloth gown? <laughs> I really, I really want to know. So I'm going to ask you again. Has anyone here been to see Dr. Glenda Jackson? <laughs> You can come up to me after the show if you don't want to admit it in front of everyone. Um, I see a lot of ads on TV, a lot of um, billboards um, going after big tobacco and letting everyone know, um, you know that cigarettes are unhealthy and dangerous and bad. And I think that's noble. I think that's important. But I, I don't understand why they aren't also going after the other health menace to society, which is the makers of Q-tips. <laughs> I think it's progress that they have to write on the box, do not insert into ear canal. It's a step. But they know full well that is the only thing anyone is doing with a Q-tip. <laughs> I, I don't know anyone that's ever used one for anything else. And they're so sneaky. Because they, they put this list on the back, like this decoy list. Like, oh, well, these are the uses. This is why we're selling them. Um, like spot removal and makeup application and self-defense. They're, <laughs> they're just like making things up so they have an excuse to sell them. And I think, you know, if the cigarette people had to write on the box, do not smoke these, would they still go on the shelves just because they also said, for arts and crafts? <laughs> no. No. That wouldn't happen. Wouldn't happen. Uh, I, I struggle when, um, when I go out to eat. And out of nowhere, the waiter will appear, and he'll ask me if I want fresh ground pepper on my entree. And I always say yes, even if I don't want it, because I'm not going to have him thinking that I can't enjoy the finer things in life. <laughs> but just try telling him that you're not sure yet, and can he leave it there? Oh, no. Oh, no, he can't do that. It's the the pepper a controlled substance, sir? You have to... <laughs> you have to protect me from the pepper? Oh, you don't, oh you, maybe you don't trust me with the pepper. You left me here with a candle.
You left me here with fire. Fine. That's enough. Now I have to make that call. You're letting me make that call. Why can't you leave it? That's enough. Um, even more stressful than that, I find, is uh, when you get the waiter that refuses to write anything down. He's got it. Like, no matter what you say, uh-huh, mm-hmm. OK, so uh, no baked potato. You want the mashed? Uh-huh, mm-hmm. OK, you want the salad instead? Uh-huh, dressing on the side? Uh-huh. I mean, how many substitutions do I need to make before he'll take out a pen? <laughs> Uh-huh. Okay, so you want, you want the mashed potatoes flattened out and then you want your name written? <laughs> your name written in peas? Uh-huh. Okay, and that's Marisol? Two S's? Got it. There are six of us at this table. How are you not forgetting something? You know what? I did forget something. I forgot to tell you the specials. We have 28 of them tonight. <laughs> 28. They're brand new. They're complex. They're fanciful. They're all up here. <laughs> From the top. My order. You're going to recap at the end, right? What about my order? Um, I realized one day that, uh, that I'm a paranoid person. <laughs> Right? It took me a while. Um, because what happened was, one day, before I was doing a show, I had some time to kill. So I went and I decided I, I parked in this grocery store parking lot. And I was sitting there for a while, um, just you know, going over my notes. And then I saw out of the corner of my eye this cop car pull in. And they ended up parking right next to me. And I was so sure that someone had called them to report me uh, in my loitering that um, I quickly flipped to a new page of my notebook. And I started uh, furiously scribbling this um, pretend grocery list um, so that I could show it to them you know, when they came to the car to prove um, that I was not the woman that someone had called in about, that I was there on grocery-related business, um, <laughs> supposed to be there. So I started doing this pretend list. And um, so I was like flour, and eggs, and milk, and butter. And, and then I looked at the list, and I thought, that is the most cliched grocery list that I have ever seen. He is not going to believe that is really your list. <laughs> no one just goes and buys staples anymore. Um, so I started to just try to get more specific. So I was like, um, cake mix and chocolate frosting and paper plates. And I hit up on a theme. And next thing you know, I was throwing a birthday party. <laughs> and, I was like, oh, he'll believe this. You know, candles and ice cream. And uh, he, they just ended up going into the store. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't about me. But um, <clears throat> I still, I, you know, I was just so thankful that I wasn't parked at Lamp World. Because, you know, no one makes a list to shop at a store that only sells one item. <laughs> Clearly, if you are in the Lamp World parking lot, you are up to no good. Really. Um, so my favorite chocolates are by Whitman's. And uh, they sell this thing called the Whitman Sampler. And the most wonderful thing about it, other than you know it's filled with chocolates, is that it comes with this map. Like you get this candy map. And it tells you what each of the items in the box are. And it has their shape and everything. And I just, I can't believe that the other chocolatiers are stonewalling and not getting on board and doing this too. They just sell you this thing, and you have no idea what it is. And they don't care. <laughs> They're just like, oh, well, that's the joy of the chocolates. And it's not. Um, 
It's not. Uh, and I can think of no other industry that would get away with this. Like if you went to buy a pie and you're like, oh, could you tell me what's in this pie? <laughs> well, how, how am I going to know? Well, you have to buy it. <laughs> well, yeah, but I don't know what I'm buying. Well, after you buy it, then you can poke it. <laughs> you can poke a small hole in it, and then you can see what's in it. No, no, just tell me, are there peaches in it? <laughs> I don't know. Well, how, how am I supposed to know? You could take a bite of it. Well, no, because I don't like peaches. Oh, you don't have to finish it. Once you realize it's peaches, then you just put it back. <laughs> Maybe someone else will eat it. <laughs> Are you serious? I mean, it's so arrogant. It's like they're saying, they're all good, so you don't need to know. They're all good. And I think they're even responsible for all that propaganda. Like, oh, life is like a box of chocolates. You're comparing your product to life itself? Really? Oh yes, life is like a box of chocolates because you never know what you're going to get. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. You know a lot of things. Like, if you were to go to college, you know, you don't walk into the first classroom you see and sit there in suspense about what you're going to be studying for the next year. <laughs> you get a course catalog. There's usually an ad drop period. Uh, life is a series of informed choices, and I think the chocolatiers need to get on board. <laughs> The joy of the chocolate. No, it's, it's its own joy. You don't need a surprise. No. Um, I don't know when this started, and I don't know who started it, but um, who's the guy that was like, you know what? Sarcasm just isn't enough. Uh, I need to put air quotes around the thing I'm saying so that people get it. <laughs> Because there's really no other form of punctuation that's taken off in the same manner, you know? Like, you never see anyone like, yes, we won the game. <laughs> you just don't see that. So I think people are like, OK, just that one. Like, you know, maybe he was at a party and was like, listen up, everyone. Earlier when I said, Wow, I really love Ellen's homemade cheesecake. I don't know that you got it, because, you know, Ellen isn't a good cook, and the box was sitting right there. So I'm going to say homemade again, but I'm going to put it in quotations so that you know I'm insulting Ellen. <laughs> and I think people were like, whoa, that, you know, OK, that caught us off guard. But that is it. No more. Um, so later on that night when some guy was like, hey everyone, you know I went to the store today and I bought a loaf of bread. <laughs> milk. <laughs> butter. Tim, what are you doing? I'm putting commas in the air so people know I'm giving them a list. <laughs> I think the pauses are enough. I think the pauses and the context are enough. There's no such thing as a loaf of bread milk butter. <laughs> Quit it. You are embarrassing me. Quit it. Uh, I think the high five is pretty good. You know, that's usually pretty good. But sometimes I get the feeling that the high five is really just um, clapping for lazy people. Because <laughs> I think they're just like, you know, I think we can both agree that what we've seen here is pretty great. But how about instead of both of us putting our hands together over and over, we just join forces and each do one. <laughs> 
about that. Some people are totally against the high five, and they'll say, like, oh, I don't, I don't do the high five, which is fine. You know, fine. Have your policy. Um, the, problem, <laughs> the problem is that that usually doesn't come up until you try to engage them in a high five. Oh, the shoes are on sale. What? Oh. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> OK. A question? What? Oh, no, no, I don't have a, no, I understand. Um, you don't do it. Uh, but mark my words, when those people uh, find all of a sudden that they have a baby or a puppy dog in their lives, they will abandon their policy. Because I think that's pretty universal, that people want to teach their dogs and very small children to do the high five. <laughs> So you can have your policy, but you will be back. <laughs> I know it. Dogs make great companions. Um, I think that the bumper sticker is losing some of its power because I think part of its impact used to be, wow, this person feels so strongly about this topic that they've been willing to devalue the second most important, second most expensive thing that they own. They are willing to ruin their paint job over this, and I have to take notice. Um, and I'm seeing more and more of the bumper sticker just taped to the inside of the window. <laughs> yes, I love ice cream, but I am not honking my horn for it. <laughs> If you will not commit to the topic, you need to stick it on your car. Um, one bumper sticker that certainly did get my attention one day uh, was this. I saw a woman driving, and she had a bumper sticker properly you know, attached to the vehicle. There was no turning back. And it said, um, my Cocker Spaniel is smarter than your honor student. <laughs> so it did. It did. And I thought, wow, that is really sad. <laughs> because riding in the back of her car was a golden retriever. <laughs> I felt really bad. I mean, he's obviously not doing as well. <laughs> and she wasn't bragging about him. And there wasn't like an I heart and then a picture of the golden retriever or anything like that. He's probably taking him to the pound, or for all I know. And I just hope that he can't read. Um, <laughs> which probably he can't because honor students usually can. And if he's not smarter than that. Um, but for those dogs that can read, <laughs> sometimes I wonder if when they're out and about and they see the signs you put up for them when they're lost, oh, oh they're looking for me. Reward. A hundred dollars? I know they have more money than that. <laughs> I thought they loved me. I was headed home. Not until that number comes up. <laughs> but you know they wouldn't be happy like that dog um, if they finally got them way up there like, a thousand dollars? If they have that much money lying around, why am I eating this dog food? <laughs> Don't teach your dog to read. <laughs> Costs too much. Um, oh, here's something that doesn't really work out. Um, um, when, you, when you decide you're going to go to the zoo to have fun. Because sure enough, uh, you will be there 
looking at the animals and realize you're not in a zoo so much as like an amusement park of guilt because you always see a sign next to the animal's cage telling you how endangered they are and how it, you know, it's all your fault because of the, the ivory tusk earrings you insist on wearing or all of the logging and you, you, know, you don't have hardwood floors at home, you know, but fine. Um, educate the public. But I think also put up some positive signs, like when an animal is not endangered. Like, hey, this chicken sandwich you're eating, it's OK. Um, <laughs> there are more than enough chickens. And they're so common, they're not even an attraction at this zoo. So you can feel good about that. Um, if you still decide, like, oh, I know what she said, but I, I'm going to go to the zoo. Uh, and you're like, but I just, I don't know when to go. Um, I have some ideas about when you should not go. And I think it's a bad idea to go to the zoo when at any point you could rationalize that the animals in captivity have it better than you. <laughs> so, like, don't go to the zoo if you're really hungry, because you'll be glaring at the polar bears, like, he's just swallowing that fish whole. He's not even enjoying it. Or like, if you're really hot. He's, he has a pool and he's not even using it. The bear doesn't know how lucky he is. He's so lucky. Um, that's just my advice. I don't understand um, in science fiction movies and books why the aliens are always so much smarter and better than us. Um, you know, I think we're pretty great. And um, they're always wearing, you know, a uniform and marching. And we still look like individuals. I mean, since when is the, you know, completely bald head the sign of an advanced civilization? Um, I think that hair can be fun and flattering. <laughs> and almost everyone here that's lost even a little bit of theirs is trying really hard to get it back. So I don't think it's a bad thing. Not to mention that they've usually come here because they have run out of food or water or energy, you know, which we haven't done yet. And, you know, I just, I don't understand it. Like, we have time for hobbies. We have inflection. Um, <laughs> and when I contemplate the highway system in this country alone, I am amazed. Just once, I would like to see them come here and be humbled by the experience. You know, like, find on the ground someone's photocopy of their March Madness tournament bracket and realize, you know, we have a lot to learn from these people. Yes, that's right. The selection show is on a Sunday. And by Wednesday night, there are hotels and flights booked for 65 teams. Mm hmm Because there's a play-in. That's right. So you see, we're worth much more to you as consultants for this type of thing than as food. <laughs> I mean, Soylent Green, that doesn't even taste good. You tried the chicken sandwich. <laughs> those are really good. Um, they sell those at the zoo. <laughs> so, yeah, do that. Um, when I was growing up in Massachusetts, uh, there was this mini scandal with some of the local grocery stores because the owners were caught fixing prices and, you know, like all getting together and deciding, um, okay, we won't charge more than this for peaches or we won't do triple coupons. And the consumer was paying, you know, the price. The consumer was hurting. And I think that something similar has gone on with all the makers of alarm clocks because I think it's too much of a coincidence that they're all doing the nine minute snooze. Like, what, nine minute, like that's the only option? I mean, I would sometimes like a five minute snooze or I would maybe some days like to be late for work in denominations of 14. <laughs> And I want that to be my choice, like, a, like have a choose your snooze alarm clock. I would buy that. Because <laughs> an alarm clock should ask you more than one question. You know, yes, what time do you want to get up? OK. What time do you really want to get up? <laughs>
Okay. And you can tell me, what time do you have to get up? <laughs> I love when people stop me on the street and ask me for directions because I feel like I've been selected to be a contestant on an instant game show. <laughs> what, uh, the pier? Yes, I know where the pier is. Okay, um, I know this, okay, the pier. Okay, okay, where are we right now? Um, there's always like some wannabe contestant trying to muscle in on your turn, like, excuse me, you looking for the pier? No, they asked me. Okay. <laughs> the pier, we're gonna get you to the pier. Because um, you know I work at the pier, so I can bring you right there. I work there. Uh, no, employees of the pier, ineligible. <laughs> Conflict of interest. Okay, the pier. Um, you know, I never want to admit that I just don't know, because it's like landing on lose a turn or something like that. Um, but they do, they figure it out when they start to realize we're gonna get more lost with her directions than just like blindfolding ourselves and looking for it on our own. And um, so then you know you've lost them when you get the, yeah, it's, it's okay, it's okay, we'll figure it out. Which really means we're gonna walk over here and ask somebody else. <laughs> I just, I never, like, it's like, what, the pier? Why do you want to go to the pier? I know where lots of things are. What about the science center? The science center's fun. It's right, it's right there. Never mind. Um, <laughs> um, the other day, uh, I got a parking ticket. I know, right? That's what most people's reaction is. Like, when they get a, a parking ticket, they do, like, a grumpy dance. Like, and when I see a parking ticket on my car, I say, thank you, Sarah, because I really feel that a parking ticket is a gift that I give to myself. I mean, I can't believe that simply by being willing to pay a little bit more, I can park wherever I want. <laughs> wherever I want, for however long I want. And I feel like I've stumbled onto some sort of VIP lifestyle. And I have to admit, there is a part of me that really enjoys it. Uh, I call her VIP Sarah. And, um, but she's, she's starting to get out of hand. She's starting to get me into trouble. Um, like the other morning, my alarm clock went off and it was time to go move my car like one of the regular people. And I was just lying there thinking, you know, I would give anything not to have to get up right now. And VIP Sarah hears this and she's like, anything? Would you give $40? <laughs> and I thought, yes, yes I would. And, and I'm gonna have to in 21 days. So, <laughs> hey, you guys have been so much fun. Thank you so much. One more time for Sarah Shea.